Uh, yes, hello and welcome everyone to our talk about our content security policy. Uh, in this presentation, we'll be talking about what happened in the world of CSP in the last 12 months. Um, we will show you how we rolled out CSP at large scale at Google to over 100 products. And we'll also show you some new keywords that finally made CSP violation reports, in my opinion, useful for the first time in the history of CSP. Um, and uh, finally, last but not least, we will talk about uh, recent bypasses, how we address them, and but also like limitations and what you have to be careful uh, when using CSP as a defense and depth mechanism. So uh, my name is Lucas, this is Michele. We both work for Google in Zurich. Um, we're working in a focus area that kind of investigates promising mitigation technologies like CSP and uh, new platform features, for example, like sub-origins. And with these, we try to address uh, cross-site scripting, which is unfortunately still a big issue at Google. Uh, it's getting better, but yeah. Um, yeah, uh, before I ask, uh, before I start with the recap, may I ask you guys, like, who has uh, worked with CSP before, with content security policy? Who have seen it? Ah, oh, awesome, a lot of folks. That's really cool. Uh, for those of you who haven't, I uh, have a couple of... Uh, intro slides, like two or three, just to get you bootstrapped uh, in a moment. So, yeah. So, brief recap. Um, so, one year ago, we presented also in Rome at AppSec. Uh, at this time, we did a lot of research on whitelist-based content security policies and how CSP is used in general for uh, mitigation on, in, in the web, basically. So we did a large-scale study, and we kind of found out that most of the policies are widely spaced, and uh, most policies are like trivially bypassable by you know automatically generatable um, bypasses. So it was a bit disappointing because in, in theory CSP offers like very nice properties, right? But it seems to, to be the case that widely spaced CSP just did not really work out in practice. Um, so we thought that maybe a non-spaced CSP would be a nice option here instead of widely spaced CSP because it has like a couple of advantages over widely spaced CSP. Uh, but there's some hurdles and to really make uh, adoption of non-spaced CSP kind of possible in practice, we worked on strict dynamic, which is like a new keyword that uh, kind of transitively propagates trust to newly created scripts, which I'll show you in a second. And yeah. So this is the research paper we presented at CCS. Uh, if you want to know more about the like, insecurity of whitelists, uh, we won't go into detail on that today. Uh, but yeah, it's a very nice uh, summary of that. So um, quick bootstrap. Uh, how does uh, a non-space CSP work in practice? Uh, the idea is basically that you have a content security policy uh, like the one on the top here. And um, basically, the browser will only execute uh, JavaScript tags on the page if the script tag has a nonce attribute and the nonce attribute value is the same uh, as the value in the nonce attribute uh, of the CSP header in the response from the server. So it's all client side. It's very important that th this nonce value has to be random for, for every response. And the idea behind that is if there's a cross-site scripting uh, vector and an attacker can inject uh, HTML, for example, then he should not be able to know the nonce, the random nonce, because it's like different for every response. That's the idea behind it. Um, in addition to that, nonce-based CSP has some very nice other properties that are especially interesting for deployment, uh, which are you don't have to come up with a host or path whitelist in the first place, uh, which is Tremendously time-consuming, very error-prone, often leads to breakages, and uh, as we saw by our research, also is often bypassable because of, uh, uh, you know, JSMP-like endpoints or uh, libraries like Angular on CDNs, which you usually whitelist uh, in your application. Um, yes, so this is how it works, basically. Uh, if you take, like, moneyexample.com, and it has like this content security policy in the response header. 
uh, scripts with a nonce attribute that matches the value of the nonce here will be allowed to execute by the browser, this old browser side, right? And it doesn't matter if it's like inline script or source script, right? Uh, on the other hand, classical reflected cross-site scripting, like the one we see here, uh, like if an attacker just injects a script tag, he does not know the nonce value, right? So he cannot set the proper nonce attribute and the browser will reject these kind of scripts. So that's the basic idea behind uh, a nonce-based CSP. Uh, so what's up with strict dynamic, right? Um, strict dynamic is basically an extension which came in uh, CSP3, and it is meant to help non-spaced and also hash-based CSP to basically ease deployment, because in theory you have to propagate the nonce to every script and every subscript that gets generated, uh, which can be very hard, especially if you use uh, uh, libraries that, for example, do like dynamically loading of uh, modules and stuff like that, also if they're constant, right? So it's hard for developers to patch libraries of others, right? So what Strict Dynamic does, it basically tra uh, propagates trust from a nonce script to a dynam dynamically created script, for example, if it is created through document element, uh, document create element script, right? Um, with this, you can, for example, nonce the, I don't know, the widget you're using, and all subsequent scripts that the widget is creating are automatically blessed, right? So you have to trust the widget in the first place, which you usually do if you load it on your page, right? And yes. So in practice, this is very important and basically allowed us to do like large-scale deployment of uh, non-space CSP. It is also a stepping stone somehow, right? Because you can slowly re start refactoring libraries to propagate the nonsense themselves. But it is, uh, yeah, quite handy for deployment. Uh, quick overview, uh, for example, stuff like parser inserted scripts like document write uh, is not blessed by strict dynamic. What is blessed is like uh, uh, scripts that are created through like uh, the DOM API, like for example, create element script and then document body append child script. So at the time we created this, uh, this pattern, uh, we, we were uh, saying that like, you know, parser inserted scripts are very likely to contain user input and are like really kind of dangerous and also it's like a bad pattern anyway so this was disallowed and create element script uh, pen child script is much more controlled right because it's a uh, code and uh, at this time it seemed like this is like very rare there was a very interesting talk just before this one in the other track by uh, Sebastian Leckis and uh, Koto and they kind of showed that these patterns are actually not so, ra so rare, um, but we'll talk about this in, at the end of the presentation. So, um, as I said, like we'll also talk a bit how we kind of mass deployed CSP at Google. Um, we kind of switched hat from like breaking everything to try to make it work and make something else more secure. Uh, turns out this is actually not easy. Um, so basically, uh, I don't know if you have ever tried to deploy a whitelist-based CSP to a big product, right? It is very hard, and it usually, like for a product like Gmail, it can take multiple people, multiple years to come up with a whitelist-based uh, policy, and it will cause breakages. It's like very hard, right? Um, with the non-spaced CSPs and uh, strict dynamic, we were able to kind of deploy uh, handful of people were able to deploy a strict CSP to uh, over 100 products in, I don't know, six or nine months, which is uh, a big difference to the how useful CSP was uh, previously, right? Um, so nowadays, like, about a billion users get served a strict CSP. It's like, as I said, like, over 150 services that have the strict CSP header. And uh, in addition to that, we get, like, over 50 million CSP reports. Uh, yeah, that's a lot, and no, we didn't break everything, it's just a lot of noise, and I will also talk about how we deal with this noise and how we kind of try to make sense out of these uh, millions of CSP reports, right? So there's a couple of examples, uh, bigger products, like, you know, uh, Google Photos has a strict CSP nowadays, Google Plus, uh, passwords.google.com, like sensitive domains, right? Um, the One of the, the you know, 
For us, very important things is that we actually built in the strict CSP support into core frameworks. And the idea is that it is on by default for all the new services, right? So a developer actually has, don't have, has to know anything about CSP or whatever, right? It's just enabled for a new service out of the box. And ideally, it would not interfere with the developer at all. It would just be uh, supported by the framework and silently work. This is very nice because uh, if this model works, right, it means that basically rolling out a strict CSP is zero effort once you have picked it into the framework, right? And this is actually the case now, and it's really nice because uh, there's a lot of benefits as a defense and depth mechanism if you have a strict policy, right? And uh, deploying it is very cheap nowadays, right? So like, that's a very good trade-off for mitigation, I think. So um, Google Plus is a prime example here. So we added uh, the support to the framework, and Google Plus is a big application, right? And usually it takes a very long time to make it CSP compatible. But in this case, since it was built on a core framework, we just had to toggle a flag, and it had strict CSP enabled. And so far we know nothing broke, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple of requirements here for this model to work, right? And that might also be a bit Google specific, but we still thought we'd like share how we did it, and maybe it is useful for other people as well, right? Um, first thing that is very important to have uh, is a kind of service independent CSP configuration. Like previously with whitelists, you had to come up with a CSP that is tailored to your application, maybe tailored to every page, right? Very hard to maintain. It uh, doesn't scale really, right? Um, next slide, I will show you what we use as a CSP, but that's uh, basically the nice property of non-space policies. They're all the same, regardless of your service, right? So you don't have to maintain the, the policy itself uh, on a regular basis, usually. So another thing that really helped us a lot are conformance tests. Uh, this is uh, some just a name for tests we call internally that make sure that developers don't submit uh, bad patterns in the code. And these tests are actually there already for a longer time, like even before CSP and stuff like that. But they were really, really, really helpful for us because one of these tests kind of disallows inline event handlers in HTML code. And so the code did not have these patterns in the first place. So it makes it much easier to actually roll out the CSP, right? Because it doesn't work very well with inline event handlers. Uh, another very important and crucial thing is that uh, the template you're using to render HTML supports auto-nouncing. Uh, I will show you in a second what that means. And yeah, last but not least, you also need sophisticated monitoring tools because if you get like 50 million CSP reports, you kind of have to deal with that and make sense out of them, right? Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's basically one policy you can technically use for almost all applications, right? Uh, at Google, we mostly use this one. Uh, you might be concerned about the unsafe inline and HTTPS on this policy. Uh, this is uh, only for backward compatibility reasons. Um, so a new browser like Chrome or Firefox that supports CSP3 will uh, be able to pass the strict dynamic. And one side effect of strict dynamic is, is that it makes the, the policy more narrow by dropping all the whitelist entries and unsafe inline. So a uh, newer browser just ignores these directives because of strict dynamic, an older browser who does not understand strict dynamic just falls back to the unsafe behavior. <laughs> but that is okay because uh, we don't want to break the site, right? So the policy is effective for new browsers that support these platform features. Old browsers just use the fallback, so you don't have to do user agent sniffing or sort like that, right? Um, and of course, there's like also other pieces that make the policy more robust. Like you have to restrict object source and base UI. Otherwise, there's like all sorts of bypasses you can do. Um, yes. So uh, the other thing that is very important for kind of easy large scale deployment of a non-space CSP is our templating systems that support auto nouncing. There's a couple. We patched, uh, I think, two or three internally. But uh, one example that is also available to the, uh, is also open source is like closure templates. Um, and it's really cool because you basically have on the server side uh, one place where you generate the nonce, you set the response header, and you also uh, provide this random nonce value to the templating system. So this is done in the core framework in exactly one place, right? And then the templating system takes care of everything else. In this case, you have like a closure template that just like creates a script tag 
and sets some parameters, right? And the output, the rendered output looks like that. The, the, the framework automatically adds a nonce attribute for you with the value that was set uh, on the backend. And the nice thing is all your HTML templates magically have the nonce set and you don't have to refactor every single HTML page, <laughs> propagate the nonce value through all these channels to the single pages, uh, set them manually, right, and maybe forget some and whatever, what not, right? So it's really uh, much easier this way, basically. And this is what scales, right? So this is also why you can just toggle a flag on G+, and it has a, a strict dynamic uh, based CSP enabled. So yeah, ship it. Um, yeah, there's a problem. There's, how do you find out if something is broken, right? Uh, what you really don't want is you don't want to roll out a CSP that breaks Gmail because your CSP will be rolled back so fast uh, that you probably, yeah, you probably won't have a chance to roll it out again, right? So you really have to be careful that you don't break existing functionality with your content security policy. Uh, originally, uh, CSP violation reports were thought to help with that, right? Because when you have a violation on the browser, and reporting is enabled, the browser sends back a violation report, and this violation report then is meant for the developer to, you know, make some sense and tell him what went wrong, if he, you know, forgot to launch the script, or if he forgot an inline event handler, or if, basically if something is broken, right? So the problem here is uh, that most of these violation reports are not actionable. Uh, we'll show you in a second why. Uh, it is basically not possible to distinguish between noise from browser extensions and real violations. And if you get like 50 million reports per day and most of it is noise, it's really problematic to find out what is actually, you know, if something is broken at all or if it's just, or fine, it's just noise, right? Um, so there's a really new, uh, there's a really cool new keyword uh, which is called report sample. And it is basically similar to what Firefox already does. Uh, it basically sends the first 40 bytes of the script that was blocked from executing. Uh, and it's already shipped in Chrome 59, which is in beta now. Uh, and in addition to the Firefox functionality, it also does that for inline event handlers, which is uh, really necessary because otherwise you run into the same problem again and you don't know if like a violation caused by an inline event handler was by an extension or your code, right? Um, so quick example to illustrate that. Uh, let's assume you have like an inline script and you forgot the nonce. You will get a report like that. Uh, same with an event handler. You forgot to remove the refactor out the event handler. CSP blocks it, right? So you get a report like that, which looks exactly like the first one. And then the problematic case is a browser extension, Chrome or Firefox extension, injects a script into your page, inline or an inline event handler. And what will happen is you will get exactly the same CSP report. So this is very problematic, right? Because there's like three different causes and they all generate the same report. And if like Chrome extensions or Firefox extensions, they're very popular, right? So you get like a ton of violation reports, right? And you have no idea from the looking at the report if this is like a breakage on your site or if it's just noise. Uh, the report sample keyword is tremendously helpful here because it sends the first 40 bytes of the script that was blocked. In this case, hello. In this case, loaded. And in this case, like some, I don't know, browser extension injected script. And with that, you can basically start building signatures for popular browser extensions, and you can take the sample and search in your code base to find out if this is actually in your code, right? And if yes, you probably have a breakage in the violation, uh, uh, and you have to fix it, right? Um, yes, and with that, I will hand over to Miki, who will talk about the uh, tools we developed at Google to make this task of deploying CSP easier. Uh, thanks, Lucas. Um, so um, what we uh, did to briefly recap is uh, we took CSP as it was a little more than one year ago. Uh, we found out there was a problem with whitelist, the, the origin whitelist model. Uh, so we added um, strict dynamic. Uh, and with this modification, we were able to, to deploy it at scale at Google. Um, this created the need for some serious tooling to prototype policies to uh, monitor violations and to actually assess the quality of the policy itself. So uh, here I present uh, three tools, uh, two of which are open source. One is unfortunately still internal, but we have uh, some plans to eventually open source it in the future. So the first one is a browser extension, a Chrome extension, which we call C CSP Mitigator, uh, which is very useful 
as a CSP deployment analysis tool, and it basically identifies parts of a page uh, uh, that are not compatible with CSP, even graphically, as we see. Um, it also helps uh, the developer make necessary changes uh, before deployment to make the, the, the web application uh, CSP compliant. And I have a very quick uh, demo here. Uh, let's uh, take, for example, Google Finance, which is uh, not yet CSP ready. Um, <clears throat> And, sorry, like screen resolution. Uh, so we start the extension and then we reload and we uh, immediately see uh, that uh, some, uh, there, are, there are some borders. Uh, so basically green border means there is an inline event handler. Um, uh, the red, red border means uh, that uh, there, is, uh, there are scripts that are not announced. And so we can, for example, uh, go around a little bit uh, the, stock, the stock screener and uh, so on. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I was hoping to trigger. I was hoping to trigger uh, one that uh, had an inline event handler, so that you would see a uh, border. But I'm not that lucky. Uh, anyway, uh, at the end, uh, when you okay. There are lots of things that are not compatible with CSP. You, see, you can see here the, the little counter going up and up. Okay, so when, when you're ready, you do stop, and a report is generated. And here you have uh, everything uh, that is not compatible, which is a lot, uh, divided by category. So for example, you have a non scripts, you have inline event handlers, and you, you can click on more, and you have the, the full code. And then there are some actionable um, information such as uh, you should do this, you should refactor markups, we should avoid JavaScript URIs, and so on. The second tool is uh, CSP Evaluator, which is open source, and you can go to csp-evaluator.withgoogle.com or use the QR code. Um, and it is basically a tool for evaluating how good a policy is, which is a very, very hard task. There are a few tools online, uh, but it is very, very hard to score a policy because CSP is evolving. And uh, Lucas is going to present it. Yes, so it's a very repetitive task, right? There's like a lot of things you have to take care of when you evaluate a CSP. And um, this is just a collection of all the checks. You paste in a policy and it will tell you everything that is basically uh, in the policy that allows like a full bypass. Uh, you can also source scripts from some other side, right, and we'll just try to fetch it. Doesn't always work, but when it works, it's, it's convenient, right? Or a safer one is uh, barkstat.org. And you see, like, if everything is green, it's usually a good sign. Especially um, because bugs.chromi.org says project zero unreleased bugs. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense to have a policy there, right? So uh, play around with it and yeah, feedback is always welcome. Okay, and uh, then internally we have uh, another tool which is called CSP Frontend, which is for um, visualizing uh, the, the sheer amount of uh, CSP violation reports that we, we get, as Lucas explained uh, earlier on. So uh, we had to come up with some uh, interesting um, design choices, for, for example, for the duplication. So we have a lot of duplicates reported that are not exactly the same, but they are exact the same in meaning. So uh, we found out that uh, leveraging script sample is very useful. And actually, sometimes it was the only piece of signal, the only signal that actually made a difference. So we have an interface with real-time filtering, you see at the top, uh, which is performed client-side of, for example, document URI, uh, and so on. I think due to resolution issues, it's not very readable. I'm sorry about that. Slides are online, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then there is a high-level view, and there is a, a detailed violation view. And you can drill down uh, by clicking on the orange, uh, orange uh, little icon uh, to see similar uh, reports across, for example, browser versions, browser, and so on. Finally, we have some tools to measure coverage uh, for HTML responses at Google scale. So for example, we can find out regressions, we can find out when uh, a property that was previously sending a good CSP policy now is sending a bad CSP policy or none at all. Uh, so this is done by integrating the CSP evaluator logic in, in such automated checks, which, is, which we found to be very useful. So uh, I'm um, going quickly to go through uh, some um, 
uh, recent bypass and what can go wrong and what are the limitations of the strict dynamic approach because it's, it's very important to, uh, to, to be clear about that. Uh, so strict dynamic is uh, not a silver, a silver bullet and CSP in general is not a silver bullet. You can't just uh, add CSP to a site to make it uh, invulnerable to XSS. And in fact, uh, while it provides a pretty good um, degree of security, uh, in at, at least as a defense in depth mechanism, uh, for uh, most properties. There are some uh, somehow complex and uh, bypasses. So, for example, in this case, uh, you just uh, the policy is just a non-space policy with script SRC. But an, what an attacker could do is inject a base tag and to evil.com. And if you have a non-script that has a relative SRC, well, that SRC gets rebased to evil.com. And the solution here is just to restrict base URI to none or self, as you see fit. And uh, another another bypass is. Um, uh, by using a combination of SVG and Denklin markup, which is a, a not particularly new um, technique, but it can be uh, pretty powerful. So in this case, the attacker adds, uh, injects an SVG tag and then uses set to animate attributes of the SVG. This makes a script, originally, pres uh, originally um, present script tag in the page part of the SVG, which is governed by actually another parser and another doc type. And basically, uh, this means that it is possible to change attributes of the script tag um, from SVG. This has been fixed in Chrome 58. There are also some techniques to steal nonces. So the, the hard part is actually to reuse them, because when you, re you, reuse, you, you want to reuse a script, a, a, a nonce, uh, well, in theory, you have to trigger a browser reload, and this means that the nonce have changed in the meantime, so you don't get script, script execution from that. But there are some, some, some ways. But let's talk about stealing nonces first. So in this case, you, we, do it, we accomplish that by using CSS selectors. So CSS3 is very powerful, and you can do, say something like that. Match all the script tags that have a nonce attribute that starts with A, and then replace the content with a record a. So this allows exfiltration of the nonce character by character. Another technique, technique is uh, trying to force a C data like mode in the parser by using, for example, dangling markup. So usually it's a form with an input and a text area inside. The text area makes basically eats up all the markup that follows and makes it um, submittable to an attacker, in this case, evil.com slash form. Um, well, CSP allows to restrict form action, but uh, this is not really the point. Uh, there could, could be some much more sensitive uh, data after like credit cards, number, or XSRF tokens, and so on, and PIIs. Um, how to reuse nonces? That's very hard, and most of the times you actually can't reuse nonces. Uh, so usually the way to, um, it is possible to reuse nonces in the page only if there is some kind of asymmetric fetch of uh, JavaScript code and execution on the same page. And you can't inject that logic, it has to be already present. Uh, another another uh, way is by uh, exploiting the multiple caches that are in the browsers. So HTTP cache is usually not a, a big problem, uh, but for example, back forward cache, which is a DOM cache, the same cache that um, when you, for, for example, fill in a form and you, do, you hit the back uh, button in the browser, um, and you see that the form is still filled, that's a back forward cache. In some cases, it might allow to um, actually um, use an old nonce. And, uh, and uh, so we, we, we can think of a few uh, scenarios here. For example, an XSS due to data received asymmetrically via post message or a persistent DOM XSS where the payload is fetched via XHR, right? So this would, this would be scenarios in which stealing and reusing nonces would be possible. So to recap, the injection of base has been fixed by, uh, it can be fixed by uh, restricting base URI, the SVG bug has been fixed, and the exfiltration of nonce in general, we dealt with it by just hiding the nonce to the DOM. So basically, during, the, during parsing, the browsers replace the nonce attribute with a dummy value, and this is in Chrome 59, uh, and this means that CSS selectors and any other technique that tries to get the, uh, the nonce would not work. Um, dangling markup attacks are a little bit more complex, and there is a proposal to forbid, com com for completely forbid parser inserted sinks, uh, which are disallowed by strict dynamic in the first place. So this would work out of the box for strict dynamic compatible properties. Also, it would enforce best coding practices. I'm going a little bit fast here because we have just a few minutes left. Um, so. Um, 
there are some J JavaScript framework on libraries that are very powerful and uh, somehow introduce bypasses uh, for strict dynamic. Uh, this is because they have a nivel like functionalities using usually non script DOM element as a source. It can be a div tag, it can be a meta tag. So basically, they have query selectors on, uh, let's say, inert tags, and somehow they they put it to evil or evil-like functionalities like the pattern that is allowed by strict dynamic, which is create element script and uh, src or text. Uh, so this is usually a problem with unsafe evil or strict dynamic. So the solution in general is to make the framework library CSP aware. So in a way, these frameworks have, are, are so powerful that often have a full featured JavaScript parser inside, inside them. So they are kind of a virtual machine in a way. So they basically take away power from the browser and they are, the browser can no longer um, enforce the restrictions. And uh, so it makes sense to have some kind of CSP.js, at least uh, a stripped down version of, of CSP since with Great power comes great responsibility. So uh, two uh, primitives would be adding a code whitelist for evil or evil things um, that are similar, let's say, to CSP hashes. Uh, this is completely different to origin whitelist that you should really forget. Um, or nonce checking. So for example, what happened in jQuery is that dot .html, dot .append, replace with, and so on, when they, you pass script JavaScript code, they, um, uh, what they do, since uh, they can't provide it to inner HTML because a script does not get evaluated when uh, pa passed to inner HTML, what they do is they uh, take the JavaScript code and they uh, do create element script and they um, put it there or they call eval. Um, this is the, the code, so you can see if there is use strict, well, you do create element script, code, append child, remove child, which is exactly what strict dynamic allows, or they just call eval code. Um, well, uh, for example, Dropbox uh, fixed the issue, the issue by just patching jQuery to check nonces. They just have a, a window CSP script nonce, and um, basically they check again, against it. We have a more uh, generic solution that it is in the appendix of this uh, of this presentation, which I invite you uh, to uh, look up. So uh, to wrap up, um, you should not use whitelist-based CSP because this is uh, always bypassable. Uh, nonce only is uh, good enough unless you run um, frameworks with symbolic JavaScript execution capabilities. In that case, you should take responsibility for that and patch them. Uh, same for nonce plus strict dynamic. Uh, strict dynamic slightly relaxes DOM exercise protection, but it, it is significantly easier to deploy. Um, in fact, we believe that most of the times nonce only um, is impossible to uh, to deploy at large scale for complex application. Also, hash only and hash plus strict dynamic are very interesting combinations. So, for example, hash plus strict dynamic, it's it's um, this idea of having a bootstrapping script, just as one script at uh, inline script that has a known hash and dynamically loads the um, uh, scripts. So this is very interesting because, for example, you can uh, not even have a, a web server or any kind of active content and still benefit from strict dynamic. So uh, in conclusion, CSP whitelists are broken. Uh, Nonces plus strict dynamic greatly simplify uh, CSP rollout. CSP is not a silver bullet, and this is very important, and I will always stress this. There are bypasses. This is a mitigation. This is a defense in depth mechanism. And uh, the bypasses are uh, becoming actually more and more uh, difficult and compl complex technically, which is good. It means we're doing a good job. Uh, and uh, CSP is still a very powerful defense in depth mechanism to uh, mitigate XSS. Um, uh, also, uh, I'd, I'd like to say, um, if a company, CSP does not come for free, uh, even if strict dynamic is easier to deploy, you sh should still put some effort, for example, in having, uh, in non-sync script tags. So for example, having um, a strict contextual auto-escaping templating system, which is actually very rare in the industry still. And so it, it is natural uh, that um, you would need uh, to uh, also take care of the bypasses of the one or two JavaScript or frameworks that might be problematic. Uh, in our experience, uh, patching, for example, jQuery, uh, it is not so hard to patch them. Uh, usually there, there are very few things per library. Uh, and we are, um, we are uh, fixed, for example, internally uh, Google Clojure uh, bypasses. And uh, we uh, hope to be able to upstream some of the other fixes to jQuery and other commonly used libraries. And uh, with that, I...
uh, questions are very welcome. Thanks a lot.